Okay, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sudarshan. And um, today we'll be talking about something not so technical. It'll be more uh, philosophical slash technical in aspects. So like, I think it'll be quite interesting. And this talk is actually titled Love at First Bite, A Romantic Journey into the Future of Us. Okay, so whenever we talk about the future, um, imagine you could go back 100 years where cars just started to become a thing. And let's say you're going to a university cafeteria and you're finding like the most forward-thinking university students in the world right now. And you tell them that you can access all the knowledge in the world with this small metal device called your smartphone. And you access this through this global virtual network called the internet. They would actually just laugh at you because even if they believed you initially, you have a hard time explaining why you use all your power to just look at videos of cats most of the time uh, or argue with people on the other side of the world that you'll never meet. So for common folk back in the day, you have been labeled crazy, absurd, a lunatic, uh, certainly, definitely admitted to IMO. So um, yeah. And based on that, you actually realize that humans are really bad at making extrapolations into the future based off, because mostly because they think based off the literature of their time, constrained by current available ideas. But we're going to try and do that anyway, because it's fun. And secondly, we're going to try and base this as much as possible on existing research in science. So as we begin, this, of course, is a love story. And like any good love story, it starts with a brave and valiant hero. And in this case, our hero is the human brain. With 86 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses connecting all of your brain cells together, I mean, in comparison to that, there are only about 100 billion stars in the galaxy. So the human brain is actually described as one of the most physically complex objects in the known universe. Um, then that's said by Gerald Edelman, who is a Nobel Prize winner for neuroscience. Uh, and one of the most interesting things about a brain is it exhibits an emergent behavior. So how you describe emergent behavior is, um, let's say you have, um, for example, life is an emergent behavior of biological molecules. Like, it's, it's any phenomenon where a small subset, subset of simple behaving objects are able to create this more complex object. In our brain's case, each neuron creates this web of consciousness that we experience every day. So this emergent behavior is actually really hard to understand from our perspective. And also, this individual subsystem, the neuron itself, is so simple that it's just a bunch of electrochemical impulses. It's literally the same as anything you see in your regular microcontroller or, you know, it's basically signals. And so one of the biggest problems is that can the human brain actually understand itself? Because we, as the hero, are really, really confused about what we are. But this is not completely true because we do have some understanding of how the general overall human brain works. We know general, we know regions of the brain do certain things. For example, certain parts control the motor cortex, certain parts control the visual cortex. Um, we know which part does planning, we know which part gives you your emotions. But on a, very, on a very specific level, we have no idea how any of these things actually work. We don't know how memory works. We don't know how emotions manifest themselves. We don't know how our visual cortex processes complex images from two image sources and manages to give us this sort of interpretation of the world. So um, Ray Kurzweil, on a book called How to Create a Mind, described the brain as a general purpose interpretation machine with very, very unique pattern recognition capabilities, unmatched of anything else that we've able to invent until now where we have come up with some other things we'll talk about later. Okay, now we're going to be talking about the other part of the love story, which is, of course, um, the partner, the gorgeous one, the graceful one. I'm guessing we all here have an eye for this person, and of course, it's computers. We all love them, right? Uh, and these are, of course, our favorite binary machines. They work off of bits and bytes. And comparing the brain to computers, the bigger supercomputers these days have a, computer, have a progress of around hundreds of petaflops, compared to a median estimate of neuroscience's gauge on the brain's computing progress, which is about 1,000 petaflops. And comparing the power consumption, Supercomputers suck up entire power plants of energy, while our brains operate about at 20 watts. Our entire body actually only uses about 100 watts of energy. Uh, and lastly, um, 
this thing we can't do, which is compute solutions to extremely abstract problems. They can do math really quickly. They can do simulations. So in some aspects, the computer is way better than us, but in other aspects, it just seems incredibly naive that it can do such specific tasks. And now we got to the point where this is a very star-crossed level problem. How do you talk? How do we currently talk to our computers, our electronic devices? We use keyboards, mice, touch screens. Most recently, we have voice and gestures, but this is all very new. And we have no way of conveying more personal human things to your computers, like emotions, um, feelings. Most importantly for this talk, love. I mean, it is a love story. I mean, if you can't tell your computer that you love it, you know, this, this talk doesn't need to exist. And last part is that uh, previous method of communication that I mentioned are rather slow, cumbersome, and un unintuitive. It's not, um, it's intuitive in a certain way, in an abstract way, but for us to be more, more in touch with computers, we have to be able to interact with it in a more unconscious manner, in a way that we're not even aware of. So imagine for a second that you could communicate with a computer um, intuitively, unconsciously. You had a computer stuck to the inside of your brain. Um, what would you do with it? Just continue to keep thinking about it until the end of the talk. And this brings us to the topic that I'm going to cover today, which is this of brain-computer interfaces, which is a technology that allows humans to connect, control, interact with a computer and any other digital device with thoughts or electrical impulses, as we talked about initially. So I know what you're all thinking. Immediately, we all always think of the fanciest thing possible, Tony Stark with his... Um, I don't know what that is, but that is not going to work because if you look at it, it only has two connection points, and that is nowhere close to the resolution to read about 100 billion neurons. So what you end up actually getting is something like this. That is me with a, a brain headset connected to it. I'm going to actually open it up here. Yeah, so it looks like this. And this headset, you can come find me later if you want to look at it, but this headset has about eight channels of input which I'll talk about later. So we're going to go through a journey into the future, and I'm going to talk, I'm basically going to help you map out the future of brain-computer interfaces from now. We're going to go in increments of two years and then doubling every year after that. So for now, this is what you see in front of you. This is something called Open BCI, Open Brain Control Interface. And this is the now of the technology. And this is also the, one of the cheapest and most accessible versions of a non-invasive interface known, known as an electroencephalogram. Uh, that's what EEG stands for. Another competing um, interface technology is known as fMRI. So the difference between these two is that fMRI actually reads blood flow in the waves to determine what neurons are activated at that point in time. But EEG directly measures the electric impulses from the outside, from the outside of the brain using these electrodes, the pointy things. You can't really see it, but it basically stabs your skin and is able to read stuff. So comparing that to other invasive technology, we also have implanted electrodes, which are basically these things, but put straight onto your brain inside your skull. But those have a lot of complications these days, especially with regards to autoimmune problems, because your immune system doesn't like foreign objects being stuck into the brain. So it will actually attack and inflame around the side of implant, the, in the implant. So how does open BCI work from a technical geeky version. It's actually really simple. It's just metal strips connected to an analog digital converter. And it's a quite unremarkable SCM32 chip that processes this data and gives you a series of waveforms. So for example, in an eight channel EEG like this, you have eight, eight different channels of EEG data that I'll show you later. So how did I get this? Um, open BCI is an open source project, so it comes with a kit. Uh, where you can buy the electrodes for about anywhere between $600 to $1,000, depending on how many electrodes you want. And then you have to 3D print your own case for it, which is sh currently shaped to my head size, so that it gets the perfect fit. So, yeah, so once you do that, you just assemble it, and you'll get something like this. Uh, yeah, this is what the output of the brain computer interface uh, looks like. Um, what you see is just data coming straight from the eight sensors that I talked about. That is a head map, which tells you which um, receptors are the most active right now, which one of the eight positioned around your skull. And that is the FFT plot. Um, so you look really closely at this data. You realize that it's absolutely garbage. Like, like you, you can't read anything from this. It doesn't make any sense. So now we're going to talk about the really, really limited capabilities of what we have right now. 
Right now, we only have eight channels for $1,000. This can go up to 32 channels for research-grade equipment. And this is shared across billions and, bi and billions of neurons. So you realize that to get any sort of reasonable extrapolation of actual information from this kind of data involves um, a lot, a lot of post processing. And this has to go through uh, the problem of having, it's the problem of the signal already being extremely noisy and susceptible because of the fact that it is outside your brain. It's, ex it's influenced by external signals as well. And also, each action, because each electrode is shared between so many other, uh, for, shared between so many other neurons, each action ends up being a confounding factor between a lot of different other actions in your brain. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, for example, hand and eye motions are a really, really common confounding factor. You might want to measure. You might, you might want to measure feelings, but you'll be reading all the movement of a patient's eye as they look around the place. So it's very, very hard to untangle this information. So uh, this ends up being really bad. Although we have had some really good um, research which uses it for very rudimentary purposes. For example, Stephen Hawking's assistive speech device. This kind of brain computer interface enables people like that, people who have uh, full body paralysis, to talk and interact with people in a more normal way. It gives them back a certain amount of their humanity. And that's actually done through reading a single cheek muscle on his face, which he can use to, make we can, which he can use to express complex thought. Yeah. All right, so as we have proven, um, right now we are really, really bad at reading any sort of electronic signal, much less nowhere close to getting reasonable data out of it. So uh, what we have is um, right now, though, is some two really powerful letters, which is A and I, which is artificial intelligence, or as we call it, glorified linear regression. Um, yeah. We're going to talk about the of the bleeding edge of, free, of neuro, neural processing, which is convolutional neural networks, which is getting really a lot of attention from big companies like Google for use in really complex pattern recognition tasks. And as I talked before, the problem we have is a pattern recognition task because we have a, we have a really highly confounded data stream that we need to untangle to retrieve specific information. So using architectures like deep CNNs, um, they are, there's been current research to use uh, <clears throat> to help PTSD patients uh, get diagnosed. <clears throat> yeah. So, <clears throat> ironically, the problem, the, the, the thing you notice is that the CNN itself is inspired by the architecture of the human brain, specifically the visual cortex. So we're using a simulation of the brain to understand the brain. <coughs> yep. So what we see here is the one I talked about, the PTSD uh, neural network. It uses a pretty, a fairly typical convolutional network, and it basically uses the EEG as well. So it uses the EEG data, it passes it through a feature extraction. I think they did a manual feature extraction in this case, and then they pass that through a classifier. So again, um, this does have very limited capabilities because a CNN by nature is restricted to fairly specific applications because you have to train the CNN for that specific application over many, 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 many data sets. Also, the available data sets are really quite small and specific, making supervised learning um, really, really difficult to conduct. It requires a team of researchers and it requires people to label your data for you. And most importantly, something I didn't mention about your brain. Uh, neuroscience has this uh, popular quote. It's called, what fires together, wires together. And that basically means patterns in the brain get solidified over time. So the brain has this uh, certain element of neuroplasticity. Plasticity which means that it will tend to change over time as you grow and evolve. So this means that once you train an AI for you, it might not even be the same the next day, let alone the same for another person, which makes it very, very hard to generalize this sort of pattern recognition without having a lot, a lot, a lot of data. <coughs> and also, um, CNNs tend to be a really double-edged sword. The more data you have, um, the better your inference will be, but it's really hard to collect data when not everyone in the world has access to an EEG, so a lot of this data has to be manually collected by the researchers. So to quote this person, uh, one of the bigger problems in brain-machine interfaces is that brain, brain signals are really weak and variable because we use EEGs and because of neuroplasticity. So it makes it very, very hard to train a classifier. So moving on, um, we're going to go past eight years now. So this is 
good well in the future, 2023 to 2027. Um, and of course, we're going to talk about our favorite billionaire, possibly nefarious, real-life Tony Stark, Elon Musk. Uh, and he has actually come up with this thing called Neuralink. I don't know how many of, how many of you have heard of it, but it is this <coughs> wireless mesh of electrodes that serves as an interface between the brain and digital circuitry. And this is actually, I'll show you a picture of it later, but it uses about 1,500 electrodes right now in lab mice. And what they realize is that when they inject this electrode mesh into the skull, uh, it's actually not that invasive, even though it is invasive, it just involves a needle, so it's better than cutting open your skull. And when they inject it, it actually integrates with the mouse brain, um, which means that biological cell tissues grow over the network, the network of electrodes. So they, they, they have a very, li very limited autoimmune problem. And this provides significantly, significantly more information compared to traditional headsets. If you have 32, you can, you can do this much stuff with 32, like get uh, neural prosthetics working. Uh, imagine what you could do with 1,500 um, electrodes. Uh, so this is what it looks like. It looks like a hairnet for your brain. And uh, they, yeah, there's not much talk about that. <laughs> So uh, what are the likely effects of this technology? Maybe like eight years from now. So it will be used mostly, according to the Neuralink team, in diagnosis and treatment of brain-related conditions, especially people suffering from many degenerative illnesses like Huntington's, Parkinson's, and dementia. <clears throat> also, it will be used in neuroprosthetics. The direct interface to the brain actually allows people to walk normally again, for example, or feel the sensations of touch. Uh, and in 2014, one of these examples is um, uh, Juliano Pinto. He performed the first kick with an exoskeleton controlled by an uh, implanted uh, electrode. Uh, that kind of similar accuracy, but much better because now we have way more electrodes can be achieved with Neuralink. <coughs> uh, <coughs> the last one is deep brain stimulation therapy. This is um, useful for suppressing epilepsy in epilepsy patients. So Neuralink actually expects to start human trials in 2020, but um, the actual benefits will probably only be seen further on, back in 2023 and beyond. So these are some existing examples of how <clears throat> we've been using implanted electrodes in our research. Uh, that person has a prosthetic arm. The people at the top are paralyzed, but they've been communicating over Google Hangouts. And lastly, Stephen Hawking, as I already mentioned. So, <coughs> Going a bit further, doubling again, 16 years, from 2027 to 2035, um, we're going to follow this assumption that Elon Musk makes, which I think is pretty reasonable given our existing track record of humans being really good at making things, is that the number of electrodes on a neural lace will double every two years, following similar theories to, as with the normal of Moore's law. I'm calling this the Moore's law of neural circuitry. And this scales. The more electrodes you have, the more data you have. Starting at 1,500 electrodes now, there will be about 384,000 electrodes on the neural lace by the year 2035, extrapolating very broadly. And there's a lot of data here, but there's still only 10 billion neurons. But we are hoping that uh, our computing power at this time is also advanced to the point where we can process this kind of data. Because if it doesn't, then there's no point to having this much data. Uh, in 2025, in 2035, we hope that massive quantities of mind data allows us to get a lot of these AI networks to perform at reasonably good accuracies to get good results out of the networks. So at this point, the effects of technology will be a widespread medical implant use, uh, expensive commercial applications will be available, which means that rich people like Elon Musk may have neural lasers implanted in their brain. Uh, and this could lead to many, many innovations like drones being flying fly with your brain. That's the most dumb one I can think of right now. I'm assuming there are better, better use cases for this, but yeah. But uh, the thing that we have to consider is that the line between medical and recreational use of these interfaces starts to blur very, very quickly as it gets more and more advanced. What should we use this for? And this becomes um, something bigger than ourselves, something bigger than what we've done before. This, this technology allows us to expand our own capabilities. And that brings us to 32 years, 2035, 2051. This is when neural networks and neural lasers get complex enough to 
unlock all sorts of new possibilities. Like there's a whole list here um, connecting us to our devices, enabling AR, VR gaming. Because you realize that the moment you can access your brain, you can access all sorts of information. You can have a visual overlay on your world. Anything that you want to, be, you want to see or perceive can be manufactured. The ability to download knowledge, for example, schools may not be needed anymore. Um, and just think about everything you could do if a computer was plugged into your brain 24-7. It's just amazing. But of course, every good love story needs a villain. And in this case, the villain is actually us. Because what we realize is that various bioethical questions will arise to the point where we reach this thing. This thing is actually called transhumanism, where uh, humans try to improve themselves, not just because they are disabled, not just because they have problems, but because they want to be better. And um, you get questions like, does it override free will? Will governments be able to control what you think? Will there be selective enhancement where rich people will get better and better, but poor people will get, not get those benefits, and therefore there'll be a social stratification happening? So without proper regulations and guidelines, we don't know where this could possibly lead us to. But at the same time, our own enemies, also the person that we are dating. Um, by this point, artificial intelligence would also have advanced and there'll be massive job automation because we already know that the, the fourth industrial revolution, as they call it, is the, the artificial intelligence revolution is, is starting to already come. It's replacing drivers, especially in the fields of self-driving. So <laughs> this, by this time, it might be replacing doctors, designers, engineers, programmers. And it's not just a matter of if, but a matter of when at this point. So to quote Elon Musk again, we need neural interfaces to compete in the future with superhuman AI. So the last bit here is 2051 and beyond. Uh, we are talking about the story that we don't know yet. I mean, we don't know much of the first half, but this part is really unknown because 2050 is a long time to look forward to. <coughs> Humans have really always been resilient. I mean, we don't even know if we'll be alive in 2050 because of all the effects of climate change, hurricanes. So, we just need to hope that making the right decisions now and then has the potential to channel where we end up as a species. And we need to admit that we generally do not know what happens. So that's why this story is a cliffhanger. But um, I mean, everything I'm saying sounds cool and all, but why talk about this now? You're probably wondering why a random person like me is talking to you about something so far in the future when you could be thinking about more pertinent problems like using trigonometry in CSS. CSS. I'm looking forward to that, but yeah. <laughs> Why am I talking about it now? <coughs> well, um, this is the state of computers in 1950s. It was huge. Um, research institutions used it most of the time. Humans, normal people like us, probably never had access to it. But in the same year, 1950s, we had the Altair 8800s, the, one of the very first um, personal computers. And you see, it looks nothing like a computer. It's a prototype of a computer. It just uses switches to communicate bits. So what we can do is um, draw the parallels between where computers were about 50 years ago with where we are now with relation to brain-computer interfaces. Brain-computer interfaces are extremely specialized research technologies, but we're just getting the ability to, as hobbyists, get our hands on some simple devices that we can tinker with and we can use to run our own neural networks for not a terribly high price. I mean, 600 bucks is pretty intense on a national service $500 paycheck, but um, yeah, um, it's a worth investment. Uh, uh, so lastly, uh, I just wanted to do this talk to convince you that uh, you should go out and try this sort of new technologies, especially brain computer interfaces, because you and I could be part of the new revolution that is to come in 50 years' time. Uh, thank you very much. All right, so the first question, uh, do you need to be bought up to use the EEG helmet? Uh, that's a good question. The answer to that is no, because if you look at it, <coughs> it actually has spikes on the end of the electrodes, which actually poke through your hair into your scalp. It actually hurts a lot when you wear it. <coughs> so you don't, but you might lose your hair in the process, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, next question. Will there be a day where we can dump all our memories into a digital form or extract things we've seen previously before us, videos or images? 
Now, I don't know how many of you have watched Black Mirror, but that is actually the plot of a Black Mirror episode. Um, and yeah, it technically, if you read enough um, of your brain, you can convert yourself into a digital form. You can convert your memories into a digital form. Actually, let me give you a thought experiment that, that I've been thinking about for quite a while. Um, let's say that you have you as your brain, and we erase all your neurons, we copy it exactly, bit for bit, over into a computer, and we simulate you. Which one's the real you? Well, you would say, I don't know, because will I feel myself on the other side? Will I be there? Because that's what we all think. So that's the problem, because uh, we as humans perceive our sense of self as a continuous stream of memories. Not exactly, but a continuous stream of something. Like we think we are one continuous being. But we do go to sleep every day. So let me twist that a bit. So let's say instead of copying all your neurons at once, every second I kill one of your existing neurons in your brain and I replace it with a virtual neuron that communicates with some interface to the existing neurons in your brain. And every second I kill one more and then one more and then one more and then one more until there's only 50% of your brain that's actually there and the other 50% is dead and it's in the computer. But you didn't know that because for the last 50 seconds or for the last few days, you've still been the same person. You didn't know the difference. And I keep doing that until every single neuron ends up in, your, in the computer and not in yourself. Now, like, there is no discontinuity. So it turns out that you can put yourself in a computer. Yeah. Uh, it locked itself. All right, um, given enough advances in technology, will bad actors be able to read your thoughts? Yes, um, given enough advances in technology, I think as long as we don't let the Singapore government control all our brains, <laughs> we'll be fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in theory, a malicious government could technically control your thoughts, pass propaganda, stuff like that. So we have to be really careful about our regulations and how we treat this, this kind of technology. Um, well, artificial intelligence people have more senses than us. Okay, this is a bit of a confused question. So <coughs> I'm gonna interpret this as um can okay, no, I actually don't know how to interpret this question. <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Uh do you think superhumans will take over humans? Well, I'm hoping that as a species we can make sure that all of us elevate ourselves at the same time. Might not be completely practical, but I hope that future us's figure it out. Because if we don't, as I talked about, we will have a lot of social stratification problems, and we don't want to have that. We want to have a more equal society. So yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you.